happy Tuesday back from Veterans Day. And um, thank you for coming out to spend your lunch with me and talk a little bit about this um, very important topic. So this topic is based on the New York Times article. I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to read it, but the article is basically addressing um, the deaths that have occurred in the transgender population nationally in the United States for this year, which they're now considering to be um, a type of epidemic uh, for transgender women. And so today, Dr. Friedman and I, um, or Erica and I, are going to talk a little bit about what that means for transgender women living in Florida. And I, specifically, I'm gonna talk, give a little bit of statistics about what has been going on for transgender women nationally, as well as for Florida. And the way I'm going to do that is by talking about my research. So I am a researcher here at FIU, and I started off, I'm an HIV researcher, uh, typically. And I've been doing that for a long time, for about 20 something years. And my research started off with at-risk populations. And during this time, especially now in current times, what is becoming more and more evident is that transgender women, and transgender women of color specifically, consistently are at highest risk for HIV. And that's how I sort of got roped into this universe. Um, so we'll begin. So the background today, again, we're talking a little bit, it's based on the New York Times Review, uh, which discusses transgender women of color and the harms that have been, um, that they've been dealing with for the past year. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about two of my research studies that will give you some context for that article. The first one is a systematic review where we looked at all cases of violence that was occurring in the United States um, for the past 10 years up until 2018 against uh, non-binary individuals or transgender individuals. And then the second study is a study called TRUST TRUST is an acronym that stands for To Reach Unrestricted Services for Transgender Women of Color. And this study is funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And right now we're in a phase of the study where we're doing interviews with transgender women and we're getting some of their lived experiences. So I'll give you some of the testimonials from that study to show you uh, what people are dealing with and the level of severity of, of these actions and the implications. And then I'll talk a little bit more about some other studies' future steps and then Dr. Friedman will come in with her stuff. So again, I'm an epidemiologist by training, I'm a researcher, and I've been doing this research since 2002, um, so for quite some time. And as we all know, when HIV first emerged on the scene, it was something that was characterized as a disease of, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the three H's, so it was a disease of hemophiliacs, of Haitian individuals, and of homosexual men, right, in the 80s. That's how HIV was characterized. But we started to see a transition through data and through the epidemiology of HIV where these th this three H philosophy was not necessarily true. And the epidemic shifts, and it depends on what location globally um, that individual is in. So we saw a shift right around the mid-2000s where it was not predominantly among MSM, that's men who have sex with men or gay men, and it was shifting more into other populations, specifically young girls and women. And then around 2013, Chris Breyer and Slim Abdul Karim who are two top investigators at Columbia University, did um, a review and looked at at-risk populations globally and what modes of transmit and what modes of transition transmission existed for those at-risk populations. And what you started to see is that you couldn't necessarily say globally that HIV was something among MSM. If you were in Asia and you were in the, go the Golden Triangle, right, which was where the drug trade was occurring and which where there was a lot of heroin use, then HIV transmission was more associated with injection drug use. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the disease was more of a, a sexual nature, and in particular young girls who were engaging in sexual intercourse with older men 
they were at risk. So in sub-Saharan Africa, it was more sexual as opposed to injection drug use, and young women were at risk as compared to other populations. And then for the Americas, so all of North America, Central America, um, parts of Asia and parts of Africa, it was really focused on MSM, but what we've come to learn now is that a lot of times transgender women were conflated with MSM. Um, currently now, NIH has started moving away from that, so that now we look at these populations separately, which makes more sense. Um, but for a long time, all the statistics that we saw, transgender women, there were underestimates of what was happening with transgender women because they were being lumped in with, with gay men. Um, and now, in 2019, where we have a deeper knowledge of HIV, we have more accurate surveillance systems globally that are connected, we have, I don't think, a clear picture, but definitely a clearer picture compared to 2000. And now we know at least for the United States and for the Americas, which is where most of my work is concentrated now, so I work typically within the Latin, and um, Latin American and Caribbean region, that really women, black women, and they can be cisgender or transgender, are at the greatest risk for HIV transmission. Um, and so that's where most of my work focuses. It's in addressing these disparities for both cisgender women and transgender women. And in fact, what we see is that the environment that a person lives in, so the risk doesn't occur because someone was born as trans or because they were born as cis. The risk is actually an outcome of the living situation that that person is in. So in our research that we have in our group where we do, we look at impoverished, impoverished cisgender women and transgender women, the health outcomes actually are parallel when we look at those two groups. And so what we're seeing is that race and economic situation are more important factors in terms of a transgender woman's health and how they live their life and what their risk is. So these are some very um, sobering data regarding uh, the deaths of transgender women. For this year, we've had um, 22 deaths thus far for 2019 and 2018, I think it was at 26. Um, and again, reinforcing that this is an epidemic and something that has to be addressed at a national level and that needs support from uh, the grassroots, really. Uh, and so these are all statistics supporting that. And then this is a theoretical framework that I use for all of my research when it comes to transgender women. And as I mentioned, the risk is not really a biological risk, it's a risk that starts with stigma. And there's all kinds of levels of stigma. And for a transgender woman of color, that person is actually a triple minority. They are gender non-conforming, and then they're gender non-conforming to a gender that historically is already at disadvantage, right? So cisgender women are already at disadvantage and they're conforming to that gender that is already uh, oppressed, you could say theoretically. On top of that, they're probably of color. That's an additional risk factor. And then for South Florida, we also have the added pleasure of documentation status or immigration status. So for the women that I work with, they actually have four levels um, of sources of stress, potentially three to four levels of stress, of stress sources. And this is where we talk about multiple minority stress. And this multiple minority stress theory that these women um, are subjected to affects their options for economic mobility, jobs, socialization, um, a number of things that increases their risk, not only for violence, but for a number of deleterious health factors, for HIV, for overall health, um, for social support, social capital. Um, the basic rights that any individual should be entitled to, they are deprived of all because of people's perceptions and stigma and lack of education, basically. So before I started this study, as I mentioned, I wanted to do a sort of review nationally to see 
what was happening across the board. Um, up until then, there were really no solid statistics that looked at interpersonal violence for transgender individuals. So this is not for trans women specifically. This is, these are for all transgender individuals. And one of the themes that emerged was that they're actually most scared of law enforcement. And this is at any level. Um, police officers, the court system, um, security guards, any person that looks like they're in a position of power that they can oppress them, they're nervous. So even if they're in a situation where they're at risk, where they've been harmed, um, where they've been threatened, they would rather not call the police because that will just exacerbate the situation or potentially make it worse. Um, there have been situations through the trust study where we've had individuals who were attacked, but then when the police showed up, they were arrested instead of the perpetrator. And then that goes into a whole different version of hell because when they get to the jail or the prison, then it's not transgender friendly. They're not um, acknowledging or affirming that person's current identity. So that's another level of mental health, stress, pressure. Um, and so the violence is a big issue. And when you talk about types of violence, it's at all levels as well. It's physical violence, threats to violence, emotional violence, sexual violence, and again, um, from people they know, from people that are supposed to be protecting them, from people they trust. And that's one of the reasons that I actually call the study trust, because when I started working in this community, um, maybe three or six years ago, no one would talk to me. They just, they had such a, a terrible taste in their mouth in general from working with researchers and working with people in general that they didn't know what I was about as a cisgender person and they really didn't know if I was worth uh, taking the time to work with. And so the first study that I worked with them on, which actually just got published, uh, this is an anecdotal story. The, the data for the drug use was very low, which I knew was wrong because they typically have very high rates of alcohol and drug use, and it was presenting as less than 5%. And a year later, when I asked them about it, they said, oh, well, Elena, we just lied to you on everything. We just wanted the money. I said, you lied to me on my data? Yeah, we don't know you. We don't know anything about you. Why would you come in here? Why would we just expose ourselves, put ourselves at risk for criminal action because I... Don't know if everyone here knows, but if you have HIV and you live in the state of Florida and you engage in uh, transactional sex, which is the option that most transgender women have available to them, that is illegal. And so if I come in as a researcher and I ask them to disclose their HIV status and their behavior, they're actually incriminating themselves. And so it takes a huge amount of level of trust. As much as they need us to provide these statistics to inform policy and make changes, there's a disconnect between our community and their community, right? Um, and this just talks a little bit more about what I just spoke about. Um, but the implications for the study was that we were able, through this study, to document with hard data the levels of violence that transgender women were experiencing. And we were also able to document that more often than not, it was Latinx and black transgender women who were more subjected to these uh, instances of violence or crime. And so then after I finished the review, then I was funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse to do a study where we collected data from transgender women of color in South Florida to look at substance use and the use of PrEP. So let me just ask here first, who knows what PrEP is and what it's used for? Okay. Oh, sorry, you have to say it over again. <coughs> It uh, stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it's a combination of, I think, anti-antiretroviral anti drugs that people take on a daily basis to prevent uh, getting HIV through sexual contact. Exactly. So this is a pill that's been approved since 2012, and it basically is the same exact antiretroviral pill that a person living with HIV would take to get their viral load down. But if you don't have HIV, 
and you think that you may be at risk for some reason for getting HIV without judgment. Nobody's here to judge anyone. Let's say you're going on vacation, you plan to have a good time, whatever, whatever your reason is, then PrEP is an option that is available to every single person in living in the United States that you can take it as a prophylaxis to prevent getting HIV. And we see an underutilization of PrEP, even though it's been approved since 2012. And this is for several reasons which are highly political. But the main reason is that when PrEP was developed, it was developed as a drug for gay men. And it was tested in gay men. There was no data on cisgender women, there was no data on transgender women, and so it wasn't widely used, even though there are segments of those populations that can very well benefit from it, right? And so I was uh, contracted by NIDA to look at this underuse of PrEP, both in cisgender women and transgender women. Dr. Jesse DeVue is the PI, the investigator of the cisgender study. I am the lead of the transgender study to look at ways that we could empower uh, all women to know about PrEP and to use PrEP in um, an educated way that could save their life. And we would do this by addressing levels of stress, which was what I spoke about before, and also then looking at how stress impacted their alcohol use and their drug use. And so where we are with trust right now is that we're doing in-depth interviews with transgender women and um, I just wanted to read a few of the quotes and I'll end there and then we'll go on to Dr. Friedman. But one thing I'd like to say in my experiences with these interviews is that often when I start these interviews, these women, two women separately have said to me that their experiences and their lives are magical, okay? Um, they have nothing to complain about. And then when you get into the interviews, you start to hear things like, I, somebody tried to kill me three different times. Um, I, I was beaten at this, and this person would characterize their life as magical. And so what I have observed, um, and I don't know if Dr. Friedman can speak to this, is that there's a culture of silence and isolation. And the silence is more like, I don't want to be a problem. I just, I just want to be myself. And so I'm going to stay very quiet in this corner and not make a noise and not make any fuss. Because one, I'm scared if anybody, if I get any attention, if it comes my way. And two, I just want to be normal like everybody else. I don't always want to be in a position of, I'm being hurt, I'm being attacked, uh, a whiner or a complainer. So they don't complain until it's the most extreme circumstances, something where another person would have that event one time and would be immediately in the police. They just extend that suffering for extended periods of time until they basically can't take it anymore. And then the isolation is sort of related to the same thing. So the older trans women, and actually the black trans women, they isolate themselves from their family and their friends because they're scared of being betrayed. Um, they're scared of having repeat experiences of things that they've uh, gone through before. So some of these quotes. Um, this is for a person whose older brother was uh, an MSM or a gay man. And she said, seeing my older brother go through so much negativity and um, some sort of hate growing up like when we were little, some sort of put me in a place where I hid any sign of my femininity from myself or any sign of being different just through somebody else's experience. Um, there are situations where I remember that I'm sure I had, that had an effect on me as a person, on my self-worth. This uh, woman, she was a white transgender woman and she was one of the people who said her life was magical. And she said, I was tied to a tree and beaten with sticks by like other kids and I was only five or six years old. And I still asked my grandma about it, like why would they tie me to a tree and beat me with sticks? And she said, I don't know, people are strange, babe, you know, but like I was always kind of to this day, I'm still hunted in a way. Um, another one, especially my brother, me and him would have physical altercations and the police would have to be called because of the way he would beat on me because of the fact that I came out as trans. 
And then the last one, my earliest memory of my own father was him coming home from his service and he beat the crap out of my brother because he was flamboyant. And he just beat him so hard, it affected me in closing off who I was. So from a very young age, they learn how to suppress and repress and just keep everything inside, which in the end, as we all know, could never be good long term in terms of health and wellness overall. Um, I'll stop there and before Dr. Friedman comes, any questions about the research or <sighs> anything that I said? And this is uh, just contact information. If you know anyone who would be interested in any of the studies or need help, you can ask them to call this number. That's for the trust study. And future steps, um, we have the Transgender Remembrance Day, November 20th, which Florencia spoke about, um, and we hope that everyone who's available will be able to support that. And then we would like to talk now a little bit more about educating yourself um, and developing awareness around gender inclusivity. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I like to move around a little bit, so if you don't mind, I'm going to do that. Is there the clicker right there? Can I use that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think that what Dr. Cyrus laid out was a bit of a, a bleak landscape for trans people. And I think something that you know, might be going through everybody's minds here is, well, how do we stop this? How do we make things better? And that's where my work comes in here at FIU. So I'm hoping that today I can give you some kind of practical guide to just kind of starting to maybe change your language, change the way that you see gender so that we can be more accepting and more affirming of people who are transgender. Um, something that Dr. Cyrus talked about was stigma. And you know, that's something that you know, we're all kind of a part of a system of thinking about gender in a particular way that leads to a kind of stigma that makes up everything that we do. And sometimes we don't even realize when we're doing it so I'm hoping that by bringing a little bit of awareness today, we can all start changing our language and adapting the way that we approach gender so that we can be more inclusive of people here at FIU, but also outside of here. So when you leave FIU, when you graduate, take that to your jobs, take that to your family, you know, have those conversations with people and start changing the conversation a little bit. So it starts with talking about inclusivity. You know, what is inclusivity? It's about including everybody who's actually there in our society. That's one of the things, this is uh, this conversation about silence and exclusion that happens with trans people. Uh, they're there, right? They exist, they're in our society, and they've been historically excluded, and it's time that we start using language and thinking about them in a way that does include them. And so inclusivity is really about accuracy. It's about who is actually represented in our society, who is actually existing, and how do we start including them. In 1870, we changed the right to vote for at least black men because we started to recognize black people as actual human beings, right? They weren't seen as human beings prior to that time. And so we're, we're accustomed to adapting our language and our laws to be more inclusive. By 1920, we included women in the right to vote because we started to see them as equal to men. At it's more accurate to include them in our society. Well, now it's very similarly with trans people, we're starting to see them and notice them and recognize that they need to be included and our laws and our language needs to catch up to that. The women's liberation movement in the 1960s were fighting for equal pay you know, they had the right to vote, had some things in place, but we're fighting for equal pay at that time. And at the same time, they're also talking about using more language that was inclusive of women. So you might remember in your English class, that switch from just saying he, he, he through everything that you write to using he slash she, that kind of awkward grammatical language. Well, there's been an evolution in language over time. It's not kind of unusual for us to change our language. It's something we've done for many, many years. If you look at early 1900s, we used many more male pronouns to female pronouns until that women's liberation movement hit, and then we switched. There was a little bit of an increase right in the 50s there because men came back from the war. 
But then women's liberation hit, and it's kind of gone down ever since then because women fought for equal conversation about women in writing and in language and also in the workplace and all of that. So we're not, it's not unusual for us to change our language. Now what the trans community and non-binary community are asking is that we switch from using that awkward he slash she thing and we just use they as a gender neutral option. So this is something that you can switch to in your own language. And act actually the, uh, there's a dictionary that just recently, I think Miriam Webster just said that they, them, there is a singular use pronoun that can be used. It's been uh, like kind of officially used now. And we kind of do it anyway, we, right? We say when we don't know the gender of somebody, when like we get an email from Alex and we're not sure who if it's a woman or a man, we use they to refer to them. Uh, and it's something we already do naturally, so now it's just something we have to kind of more actively do to be inclusive. So here are some pronouns that you might have come across before and some that you might not have. So she, her, hers, he, him, his, they, them, theirs. Also, these are zers, that's, a, that's another kind of gender neutral one that comes from a history of our language that some people in the trans community will land on as, as something that fits them the best. Uh, for me, I use all pronouns, so all are welcome for me. Some people feel comfortable with that, and also some people use their name, just use a name in place of it. Now, what I'm going to do for the next few slides is show you some ways that people will use these different pronouns attached to uh, particular labels for themselves. So, you know, what does a trans woman typically use? What does a trans man typically use, et cetera? And I'm going to use a little help from the flying gender unicorn to do that. So it's kind of a silly little depiction uh, of the differences between our gender identity, our gender expression, and our gender assigned at birth. And I'm going to use this as a tool to communicate some definitions and terms of different trans identities. Now, Dr. Cyrus just used a whole bunch of different terms in her previous presentation, and I'm going to hopefully shed some light on what some of those terms were so that we can all start using them more accurately and also applying the correct pronouns where they might be relevant. So just to give you a little breakdown of this, gender identity is what goes on in our head. That's how we think and feel. It's our sense of our gender. It's what we wake up in the morning and we go, okay, this is who I am today. And that can be a bunch of different labels, right? You could identify as non-binary, as transgender, as a woman, as a man, or some other label. So there's a blank there. You could fill that in. Gender expression is how we outwardly express our gender on our bodies, how we communicate it to others, um, how we want to feel in ourselves that day and express it to the outward world. So that can be some neutral or undefined things. So some things don't have a gender. Right? The color yellow doesn't really have a gender in our society. Feminine, masculine, things that you know are contextual though to a particular culture. And then gender assignment at birth, that's what usually a doctor tells your parents you are, either even before birth, in the womb, through a sonogram, or, um, or afterwards when you're born. So there's three options there, right? Female, male, and also intersex. Well, we're going to go a little bit into depth into what that is, because we don't usually talk about that third category, and I'll tell you a little bit more why. But cisgender, you heard that in the last presentation. Cisgender are uh, people who identify with the gender that was assigned to them at birth, so this could be like a cisgender woman who was assigned female at birth, identifies as a woman. This is how it would map out. Right? You got sliding scales up there. So you could circle different areas on each sliding scale. For a cis woman, this is typically what it would look like. Assigned female, identifies as a woman, typically uses she, her, hers pronouns, but you gotta ask, right? you never know. Maybe they prefer they, them pronouns. For a cis man, someone who's assigned male at birth identifies as a man, typically using he, him, his. Now these are the ones that were, were you know, pretty typical, right? We're all comfortable with these ones, but, but you might not have ever heard of cisgender before. Well, that's what it means. Transgender are people who self-designate their own gender. And this is their self-identity rather than the gender that was given to them by other people, by that doctor when they were born. So a trans woman is someone who was assigned male at birth and identifies as a, as a woman. So this is how it might map, map out up there. And just like Dr. Cyrus was saying, some trans people, they just wanna be normal. They just wanna fit in. And so they might not even identify as transgender. If you notice up there, that one isn't circled. It's just woman. They grew up their whole life feeling like a woman. They identify as a woman currently. They just wanna fit in as a woman. And so that's what their identity reflects. 
Typically, we'll use she, her, hers pronouns. But again, you got to ask. Maybe they prefer something else. Trans man assigned female at birth identifies as a man. Note that the, the term reflects the way the person identifies, not how they were assigned at birth. That's important. Right? It's about affirming the way a person actually identifies their gender, not what some doctor said that they were when they were born. So typically using he, him, his pronouns if they're a trans man. And then non-binary. These are people who identify outside of that male-female binary. And this might mean that they identify as both. It might mean they identify in between both a man and a woman. Or it might mean they don't identify at all as either one. Both are valid. They could have been assigned as a female at birth. They could have been assigned as male. Or they could have been assigned as intersex. Doesn't matter. And they might sometimes use these kind of gender neutral, they, then, theirs pronouns, but not all the time. You still have to ask and find out. And I'll give you a little practical guide at the end on how to ask and how to have those conversations about pronouns. So that's coming. But I kind of skipped over the gender expression piece, so I want to just take a moment on that. So when it comes to gender expression, you know, this is really about context. So I'm going to look at this picture up here. This is a former US president at two and a half years old. This is in 1884, so can anyone guess which U.S. president this was? You can just shout it out. Teddy Roosevelt or Ronald Reagan? Ronald Reagan, who would have to be pretty old. <laughs> um, it's, it is a Roosevelt. It, this is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So yes, back in 1884, in the 1800s, all babies were dressed in white gowns. And at that time, it was practical. They were dressed in white gowns because the diaper could be easily accessed. And we didn't have fancy laundry products back then. So they just bleached everything. So white gowns was what everyone was dressed in. It wasn't pink or blue, right? Um, and you know, he came from wealth, so he was dressed in little patent leather shoes and hats to pose for a picture like this. And the point is, is that gender norms change over time, even in our own culture. So we might be right now doing gender reveal parties with pink or blue balloons bursting, but this is, this is you know, something that changes, right? It's contextual. And if you look cross-culturally, even right now, all the markers up on this map are cultures that have a third or fourth or fifth gender in that society that's widely accepted and in sometimes a, a revered identity or role in that society. So if you look at the markers that are over the United States there, that's our Native American friends who have two-spirit people in their society. Uh, many of them are masculine women or feminine men who are a gender role in that society that's very important and actually highly esteemed in that society. Look at, all, look at all that. We're not just in a kind of like a moment here in the United States. This is something that exists over and over again throughout time and culture. This is a photo of a student at Ohio State University. Uh, in 2012, this photo was taken and posted online to reddit.com. And a bunch of people were commenting on it, wondering what gender this person is. Uh, it was posted in the funny section with the title, I don't know what to conclude from this. And someone told the student, one of, one of their friends told the student that it was posted. And so the student went online and commented under their own photo. She said, yes, I'm a baptized Sikh woman with facial hair. Yes, I realize that my gender is often confused and I look different than most women. However, baptized Sikhs believe in the sacredness of this body. It is a gift that has been given to us by the divine be being, which is genderless, actually and must keep it intact as submission to the divine will. So this was Balfrey Carr in 2012, and she is in fact a cisgender woman. She identified as a woman throughout her life. She was assigned as a woman at birth, and she happened to grow a beard. And she wears a dastar, and that throws people off, right? Because it's, our, our, it's a, her gender expression outwardly, and that's not something that she chose, right? This is something that was a reality of her body, but also part of her religion. You know, we would say, well, why wouldn't, she cho why wouldn't she shave it? Well, this is something that her religion actually dictates to her, that she's supposed to focus on her spiritual path. She's not supposed to focus on any kind of body manipulation as part of her religion. So it's important to talk, think about intersectionality when you're thinking about gender expression. 
because a person might be coming from many, many different kinds of backgrounds or you know, socioeconomic status that might be dictating how they are presenting their gender to the world. So for example, anybody know who the person is on the left in this photo? Just shout it out. It is Janet Mock. And the person on the right? That's Chaz Bono, yeah. So Cher's son on the right. On the left is uh, Janet Mock, very famous trans woman who's an author. She's a producer for the show Pose on XF, uh, FX. Um, she, is, uh, she and Chaz Bono uh, are able to look the way that they do because they've gotten support throughout their lifetime in the gender that they identify with. So at a very young age, Janet Mock was able to go on hormones and develop the way she looks into the way she looks now. So you have to think about all the different things that people are bringing to the cable outside of just their gender identity and their gender expression or the gender they're assigned at birth. You also have things like class. You know, Do people have the money to make a transition to look like the gender they identify with? They might not. So you have to be aware that everybody that you're going out into the world and approaching, they might have a gender expression that doesn't necessarily fit the way they identify you still have to be conscious of that and try to use language that's going to support who they are. So how do you do that? We will get to it. Promises, right? Promises. Um, so that's about gender expression and just things to keep in mind with that. But I skipped over intersex, and I think it's really important that we discuss that, especially uh, when it comes to how we're approaching and thinking about gender, because we often think about it in this very binary way, right? Men and women, that's all that exists. Oh no, I'm going to show you lots of depictions of genitals now. Yes, that's what's going to happen. Because uh, we have to break the stigma a little bit. We don't get to talk about this stuff, right? We, get, we talk about it in our health class in high school for like a few days. Like, that's it. But this is like our entire lives. This is who we are. So surprise, this is what we look like before about the seventh week and when we're developing as a fetus. This is what everybody looks like. We all come from the same stuff. There's no Mars versus Venus. It's, it's nothing like that. This is where we come from. At about the seventh or eighth week, we have differentiation. So this is a conversation that happens in medical schools, right? Med students, anybody pre-med or, yeah, anybody? Yeah, a couple of people. So this is a conversation that happens in med schools but doesn't really happen in other realms. But there is a group of people who don't get differentiated, right? They continue as intersex or undifferentiated genitalia. So you have this typical splitting off into what we label as female or male as a society, but you still have people who are identified as intersex. There's about one in a thousand births who form some kind of intersex variation. And that's a lot of different variations, not just external genitals. So that includes chromosomes, so we think XX is for female, XY is for male, not all the time. There's about 14 different variations of our gender chromosomes. Look at all these different variations. Right? On average, one in a thousand births. We don't talk about that. For external genitals, if we're just talking about that, because penises and vaginas everybody cares about, if we're just talking about that, 360,000 births a day, that, that's about 720 births a day are, have external genitals that are some kind of intersex variation because it's about one in 500 for those ones. So 720 babies are born a day with external genitals that don't fit that binary that we like to put on everybody. And I say we put it on everybody because there's this genital spectrum that actually exists. This is what it looks like. But what do you think happens when a baby is born in that intersex category? Doctors were actually put a ruler up to the baby and measure. So if a baby's clitoris or penis falls in this range, this 1.5 to 2.5 range, it's labeled intersex. And what do they do from there? Any guesses? I don't know if it's on. Oh, do, does the doctor pick one or the parents pick one and cancel the other one? And, and do some kind of surgery, yes. Um, so typically they will do like a chromosome test or something to see if the chromosome will give some clue to which, which direction. But then again, 14 different variations of our gender chromosomes, right? So sometimes that doesn't always clear up the picture for them. But what they will typically do is some kind of cosmetic surgery and watch the screen. This is often what they'll do. That's the most typical surgery. So. That's reality, 
and then we go to bodies and we gender bodies. So we're so committed to that binary that we'll actually perform a cosmetic surgery on a baby without its consent. Intersex society in North America is actually fighting for the rights of babies to give consent, to have consent before that surgery is done. Not a little baby, but let the baby grow up and decide for itself. Does it, is, does it feel like it's a, a man or a woman? And then have that surgery done later or take hormones or, or do what it wants to do later. Uh, there's a lot of you know, negative uh, outcomes of those surgeries. So a lot of intersex babies that have those surgeries done will lose sensitivity. You know, there's other negative outcomes that come from it. Okay, so back to the flying gender unicorn. There's a lot going on with gender that we don't really talk about. Uh, and we have so much that's involved in our gender that we can't even really make any assessment on where gender identity comes from. And that's something to keep in mind. You know, there's all these different layers to our gender that even scientists don't even really know what's, you know, what's actually happening. All they know is that it's way more complex than we've ever actually talked about before. It's not as simple as this binary. And that's important just to keep in mind. That's just gender. Then we have sexual identity on top of it. It's a whole other separate thing, okay? We're not talking about uh, L, G, B people, right? Lesbian, gay, bisexual people is separate. But yeah, this, could, this is a whole entire lesson. So I do trainings on this, and you can request one of those through the MPAS office, and I go in depth into the whole, this whole thing. But here's the practical guide. So if you all wanna whip out your phones, this is the time to take a photo of this. So what you wanna do is not assume what people's genders are. Okay, most of the time you're gonna assume correctly, but what do you do when you're not right? So it's better that we all get into a practice of asking people how they identify and how they wanna be referred to. So you wanna affirm people neutrally. And what that means is you don't wanna assume based on how they look, how they're expressing their gender, and you don't wanna assume based on their name. Um, so if the person didn't already tell you what their gender is or what their pronouns are, you can ask them. You just gender and neutrally use their name until you have that opportunity to ask them. And you can share your pronouns first as kind of a signal, and maybe they'll share them right back to you. And if that feels weird to ask outright, you can kind of preface it and be like, hey, I kind of ask everybody this question because you never know nowadays. So what are your pronouns? These are mine. And that's a way to kind of start off the conversation and ease into it. Um, you want to be polite. Don't expect people to share their pronouns. They not, might not be in a place to share them. They might not know what you're talking about. That's fine. You can just move on. Just don't ever ask people about bodies, about surgery, about medications that they're taking. That's not any of your business. That's between them and their doctor. Uh, I always say if you wouldn't ask like your grandma those questions, you probably shouldn't ask a stranger or even your friend unless they're cool with it. Um, not everyone's going to want to answer all of your questions. Remember, it's not their job to educate you. You want to sensitively ask people first, ask, ask people if they're willing to share that information with you, but pretty much go with someone like me. I'm an educator. Ask me those questions. So I'm hoping that in our little round of Q&A, you can ask me some of these questions and we can clear some of that up. This is like a safe environment where we can all just not have judgment, right? No judgment of each other. We're learning, so do ask the questions today that you have while you're here. Um, and understand, mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. I make mistakes. I mispronoun people all the time. And I'm, the, I'm educating people about this. It's hard. We're cognitively brought up in this binary system. And it's really hard to undo that language. But if we're all just putting in a little bit of effort, that's what's important. And you can show that to people. You can show that to the trans community. You know, if you make a mistake, just apologize and move on. Don't make it about you all of a sudden, you know, and your guilt around making the mistake. Just move on from there. Apologize, correct it, and that's it. Okay, that's pretty much it. Except I might, my last little plug for next week. Uh, Wednesday is Trans Day of Remembrance. We'll be in the GC pit. There'll be a resource fair. There'll be giveaways and all that kind of fun stuff like you're used to seeing in the pit. But then afterwards at 5.30, we're gonna have speakers. So we're gonna have um, some trans students who are gonna speak, some community members as well. So if you wanna continue your learning, learn from this community, I encourage you to come to that. And yeah, we're gonna have a candlelight vigil for all the people who have died. Again, 22 people already this year. So we hope to see you there.
for our Global Medallion students, um, you get points for attending the event. Okay, I guess we're going to take some questions now. It's, I'm sure it exists in, on those continents, in, in those countries. Um, it's just whether or not it's a somewhat accepted role or not, that's why it didn't show up on that map. Yeah. So I don't know if they heard your question, but it the question was uh, about the map, and Mongolia, China, Russia didn't have any markers on it, and that's probably because those countries are not very accepting of those particular gender identities. That's why they didn't show up, because that's more of a map of they're well-known um, and, and at least somewhat accepted on some level. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I, I saw the phrase brave space on one of your earlier slides, and I was wondering if yes. you could explain what, you, wha what a brave space is. Yeah, so there's a couple of different definitions of brave space depending on what communities you're in. So um, brave space was used uh, to differentiate between a safe space and a brave space. So brave space was used to say that we need to create learning environments for people where you know, they feel like they can bravely discuss really difficult topics and not have any kind of uh, f like speech you know, kind of squashed out in those environments. So any kind of conversation is warranted in a learning environment. So it's not like you're gonna offend somebody else in that room, but you're still gonna be respectful in the, in the word choice that you're gonna use. Um, in another realm and another definition of brave space is that you can never really have a safe space. What you have is spaces where people can feel the courage to speak up and to identify who they are and have conversations that can be a little bit harder. I have a question. Um, you were talking on your study before how the four levels, levels of oppression, right? And one of the things that I always think about when I when I think about transgender, is the few opportunities for making a living, right? So mo a lot of times they get engaged in commercial sex, really, because there's no other form of um, supporting their families on themselves. And then they get judged for engaging in those very, um, sometimes like dangerous situation and all of that. I know in countries like Argentina, they're implementing programs um, continuing education programs, and give opportunities for further um, engage in other aspects, and, and again, increase lo knowledge and, so and stuff like that. My question, I guess, is do you know of other um, initiatives like that in the US, or even at FIU, if you know even scholarships or something that we are doing to increase opportunities, right, um, for transgender people? Sure, so I can't speak to the entire country. I'm most familiar with uh, South Florida specifically, not even the entire state of Florida. And unfortunately, I can only speak to a few initiatives that I know about that are related to public health because I'm in the College of Public Health. But um, the first thing I would say is that um, there was a woman called Ariana Lint, and she has a center called Ariana Center. And she specifically addresses economic employment opportunities for transgender individuals. So about two months ago, she actually had a, um, a career fair for trans individuals where she invited um, uh, employers as well as people who are interested in getting jobs to connect. So she has that. Trans Social also has some initiatives. Um, in public health, we do have a scholarship, which is an inclusivity scholarship, specifically for um, individuals who may fall anywhere on the spectrum. Um, and then in terms of research, so, you know, it's a little bit of pulling the cart ahead of the horse because the National Institutes of Health, who's our federal uh, research body, they really want us to address these dire, what they consider to be dire issues, which are drug use and HIV. But we have all these underlying things going on, mental health and economic opportunities. So it's been an issue that keeps emerging in the course of the trust study. We actually ask women at the end of their interview if there's one thing that you could do to improve the lives of trans individuals, what would it be? And 75% of the time they'll say, I want a job, or I want to go to college, or I want a skill. For Florida, there are trans individuals who were licensed outside, outside of Florida in their countries of origin. It could be Colombia or uh, Cuba or wherever. 
But when they come over to the United States, because it's their dead name, and I don't know if everyone here is familiar with that concept of a dead name, but it's literally when you um, transition and you become the I your authentic identity of who you uh, are, um, they abandon the name that they were, uh, not all the time, but often, they will abandon the name that they were born with. And so all of their licensures and their CV and all their qualifications become almost obsolete. So they can't, I know people who are physicians who can't do anything in the United States just for that, who can't even get on a plane actually. They, it's very, very limiting. And then we have a study that we are proposing to NIH that is a microfinance study specifically for transgender individuals. And it's a microfinance study embedded in a health outcome. So what we're saying is that if, you, if we do something, and it doesn't have to be cash, but if we do economic incentives and skill building while we're um, sort of building up mental health components, that in the long run, we will see all types of improvements in terms of health, not just uh, HIV risk reduction, but risk reduction in terms of substance use, stress levels, um, just overall general health and well-being. And so that is a study that will start in the fall of 2020, and we will be recruiting for that as well. Um, and if there's anything else that comes to my mind, I don't know if you know of any. I love all the work you're doing. It's so great. <laughs> Um, there's just a couple of things. Uh, Transsocial was one that you mentioned, so I'll just plug that one. Um, that's a really great organization here in Miami, and they do a lot of really great work to support trans people in a lot of that the transition um, and getting connected to resources and career. And they do case management with them. Um, and there's also Trans Inclusive Group, which is another one in Miami. Um, we also have the Out and Proud Scholarship through the LGBTQA office, specifically for um, our students here at FIU. There's the Aqua Scholarship that's for women, but that also includes trans women and non-binary people. Uh, so there are scholarships available to help students. So. I'm just wondering if there's a compiled list. So this is actually me speaking to Erica in front of all of you, but is there a compiled list where we can centralize that information so that a person wouldn't have to come to me, come to you, come to Ashley and Morgan. You know what I mean? Can we work on putting all of that together at some point? I got here four months ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of my goals. <laughs> um, but I believe that our scholarship website here at FIU actually includes some of that stuff. But I'm trying to get that like centrally located on our LGBTQA site as well. Yeah. Well, I have a, a comment. I wanted to say thank you about the the intersex, because the first time I heard about it was on an episode of Grey's Anatomy, mm. but I didn't really like know about it, and now I see the difference between two to 2.5. Um, my question was more of like the transgender, with you know, I know it's really hard for them to get a job. Is it, is it a norm for them to give up? Like just go, I don't know, like I don't know how to my question, because it is hard and people do judge them and they don't get these jobs. You can take a stab and I'll fill in after. First of all, I don't want to lump them all into one category and say them, right? So uh, they're a diverse group as it is, right? So not every trans person is going to have a difficult time trying to find a job. It really depends. Like Janet Mock up there and Chaz Bono, no problem. Um, so it really depends on the group that you're talking about and the individual that you're talking about. Um, but in general, if we're, if we're talking about um, you know, uh, trans women who maybe are in transition, about to go through transition, um, who don't necessarily express their gender as their gender identity yet, they might have a bit more of a difficult time. And in fact, in Florida, the laws do not support um, actually, sexual orientation and gender identity are not protected in employment, so you can be uh, you can be fired just based on that and not based on your work. So, um, yes, it is difficult, and I think, yeah, I mean, mental health, right? We, we need we need these things in our lives to to sustain us. So, if those basic things aren't there in the first place, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think everybody in here has taken Psych 101. You don't have the safety. You know, you don't have that that initial bottom layer of support. It's gonna be really tough to work your way up that ladder and and have a fulfilling life. Yeah, I um, I agree completely with the comment about 
seeing each person as an individual because their experiences, their similarities, but they can be vast um, and very different. And what I would say is it's sort of like a paradoxical type of situation. When you look, if you just look at something like survival, they have immense resilience and survival because if a, another person in a situation that has that level of compounded stress could survive, I don't know, that's, that's um, the probabilities, I'm an epidemiologist, but the probabilities of that is sort of low. But by the same token, when you say give up, um, I wonder about the definition of give up, right? Give up could be the statistics of suicide, suicide ideation, self-harm, also sort of relegating yourself to, I'm not even going to try to come out of this world because this is, as far as I know, the only option that I have. So there's not even an attempt to come out of transactional sex, right? So give up, I don't know. I, I, again, I wouldn't make such a sweeping statement. It's a balance of survival, resilience, and acceptance of what the system is and sort of feeling like there is no other option. But then for sure, I think there are people who can't cope, you know? I'm really glad that you mentioned resilience. And we have research to support that, you know, that resilience does come from marginalization, but also you have to have certain things in place already, like a community to support you, and oftentimes already having a certain level of self-esteem, a higher self-esteem, for that resilience to really sustain itself and to, to work out in positive favor of that person. Well. Thank you so much. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I want to thank you both so much for being here. Um, please join me in thank thanking them. Thank you.